We are here with some more of the fact electrician. This time we're checking out Olympic sniper turned battleship commander, Willis Ching Lee. Let's go ahead and shut up and turn it up. This gunslinger of all time, and you've probably never even heard of him. Today we're talking about Willis Augustus Lee, aka Ching Lee. This man won five Olympic gold medals Name in a single familiar. year for shooting, Ching then Lee. went on to become a battleship commander and used the same principles that he learned at long-range precision shooting and applied them to the massive 16-inch guns on the USS Washington to become the most successful battleship commander ever, and he did all of it with myopia. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Deliver, and he did all of it with myopia. Nearsighted is myopia farsighted okay okay yeah i think i'm but farsighted first, sponsor, What's the this word video for that? is brought to you by delete me oh nicholas i thought you would never ask is that a real mp5 come and find out i uh i gotta i gotta go i'll be right back one minute maybe two hell make it three Sorry about that. Like I was saying, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. All right, here's the deal. It's super straightforward. You give Delete Me money, they turn around and they make sure the data brokers on the internet aren't selling your personal information. Because if Delete Me submits an opt-out request, these data brokers are legally required to take I wish that I information do. down and quit selling it. I wish I could do the that problem stuff is, there's hundreds of data. She says she would never be on camera ever. So data brokers and they make it unnecessarily difficult to submit these opt out requests. So delete me does all of that for you. And yes, most of these data brokers more than likely have your information because we've all signed up for a free trial or we've all downloaded a free app. And whenever you click that little check mark that says, I agree to these terms of service inside of those terms of service, it usually says, Hey, our app or our service isn't actually free. And the way we make money is we use this to harvest all of your data. And then we turn around and sell that data on the internet. And that's how we make money. If so facto, our app or our service isn't free, we've just turned you into the product and now we're gonna sell you. I think we can all agree that's not cool, but that's the unfortunate fact of life. Nothing is actually free. But here's the good news. You sign up for Delete Me, you use that's the discount right. code electrician, it's gonna save you 20%. You're gonna end up paying like $6 a month to get all your information deleted off the internet and all that free shit that you've already enjoyed. While it might not actually be free, Delete Me can make sure it only costs you like $6 a month instead of having all your personal information sold on the internet. So go check them out. I'll have that link and discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. On today's- You know, I do I do appreciate, and I'm pretty sure his sponsors do, that he that he doesn't just reuse the same video, right? I feel like he has, he always adds some extra stuff in his sponsorships. That's pretty cool. Episode of Badasses with Bad Eyesight, Ching Lee, born in a small town in Kentucky in 1888. His father was a local judge and had a lifetime passion for shooting, a love for shooting that he would pass on to his son, Lee Jr. By the time Lee was 10 years old, he was such a good shot that he could shoot a bird in flight with his 22. Because of that, he became his small local town's pest exterminator. Anytime How anybody impressive had is any that? rodent or any type of pest that they wanted gotten rid of, they would call the young Ching Lee and he would take care of it for them. In addition to his passion for shooting, he also thoroughly enjoyed blowing shit up for fun because, well, there's now a whole lot to do in Kentucky in the early 1900s and America. There is poop on everything! Unfortunately for Lee, this would bring about a lifetime full of problems because one day him and his brother decided to fill a coffee can full of black powder, have a line of black powder leading away from the can so that they could light it safely. They lit it, the fire went all the way down the line of black powder into the can, and nothing happened. So they waited, and then nothing continued to happen. So finally, Willis Lee approached the can, looked at it, got close, opened it up, and then it blew up in his face, giving him severe burns all over his face and eyes. Of course, Due to the severity that's... of the burns, it was believed in the days immediately following the accident that Lee would be blind for the rest of his life. Wow. Fortunately, he would regain a significant amount of his eyesight. However, his eyes were permanently damaged and he would have to wear thick glasses for the rest of his life. So obviously the young Ching Lee was a pretty rambunctious kid and that translated over into the classroom as well because he is the classic case of the kid that's so smart that school doesn't interest him or keep him stimulated. So he has a bad habit classic. of getting off task and doing things he shouldn't be doing. Uh, mainly he was a prankster and a humongous smart ass. For example, when he was 12 years old, he was already chewing tobacco and the teacher would always confiscate his pouch of tobacco walk it across the schoolhouse and throw it into the wood burning furnace in the corner this, depending on i mean he said early 1900s because you i've seen some images of like kids with like cigarettes and stuff like smoking at a really young age i don't know obviously i i'm pretty sure it was frowned upon then uh was it easier for them to get access to it right than it is like today actually shoot now that i think about it easier hmm. Finally, Lee got sick of the teacher burning up all his tobacco, so he went home, emptied tobacco out of the tobacco pouch, filled it full of black powder, and stuck that in his pocket and waited to go to school the next day. Sure enough, teacher confiscates the pouch of black powder, walks it over to the furnace, throws it in, blows up the entire wood furnace. 
And then in true smart ass fashion, when Lee got in trouble for it, he said, look, this isn't my fault. You took my shit, didn't ask me what it was, and then threw it into fire. That's 100% on you. On another occasion, the teacher had the audacity well. to send Lee home because his shoes weren't shined enough. So he went home, shined his shoes, stuck paper sacks over his shoes, and tied them up top with a rope. He then walked to school and refused to take the paper bags off because he didn't want his shoes to become unshined and not be within the school's <laughs> dress code. With the culmination of all these things, Lee's father realized that he needs nightmare. to get his son into the military as soon as possible, so he has some way to positively channel all of this energy, otherwise he's going to end up in jail or worse. So being that he was already a judge, he pulled some strings, gets his kid into Annapolis at the age of 16. Annapolis is where he would get his lifelong nickname of Ching. Originally, it was Annapolis. a different C word that's actually a racial slur. Apparently, it changed to Ching over time just because it was easier to say. Now, they didn't give him that name because he is Asian. He's a white dude from Kentucky. However, he does kind of look like he could be Asian. He wears round, thick glasses. His last name. Nah, bro. I 100% thought he was Asian. Oh, okay. Name is Lee, and he is a huge Asian history nerd. Sometimes even going as far as I signing even, his signature. Oh, I didn't even peep the first name. Oh, wow. Okay. Chinese symbols. What I'm trying to tell you is if this were modern times, this dude would definitely be watching anime. Kakarot, you've never kissed someone? Huh? No, of course not. Why? You're married and have children. Yeah, duh, but what's that have to do with kissing? You now, for his entire four years at Annapolis, he is thoroughly unamused Just smash. with coursework. No he pretty kissing. much speeds through it as fast as humanly possible so he can get back to studying things that he likes and going out and shooting guns. Now, because of this, he does join the Navy shooting team, and his senior year, he gets an opportunity to go represent the Navy in a huge national competition put on by the National Rifle Association. At this competition, there is a rifle competition and a pistol competition lee has been selected to participate in the rifle competition now this rifle competition is a huge deal there are 684 people there competing and they are all qualified Jeez. to be there regardless ching lee ends up winning first place earning the gold medal by getting a bullseye at a thousand yard target and he wins the entire thing before lunch not really having anything else to do for the rest of the day he's like fuck it i guess i'll go do the pistol competition now too just for funsies fast forward about 80 percent of the way through Easy this pistol mode. competition and ching lee is winning and he wasn't even there to compete in the pistol competition. And as he's shooting different targets, his pistol blows up in his hand because one of the rounds that he had had too much black powder in it from the factory. It blew up his gun and messed up his hand. Not giving a shit, turns around to his buddies watching, somebody throw me a pistol. He grabs it, catches it with his left hand, finishes the round with his non-dominant hand, and goes on to win the pistol competition as well, earning two gold medals, being the only American to do it. So after that, he goes back to Annapolis. He's got both. I feel like that's like some type of stuff you see in a movie, like some Captain America stuff. I both sitting here with a presumably burned hand, you would think anybody would be rolling around screeching in absolute pain and agony. He says, <laughs> that wasn't even my final form. <laughs> both of his gold medals. He's basically the Kevin Gates of gold medals, if you will, and it's time to graduate. Now, bad news, he has to take a physical first, and after going all the way through Annapolis schooling, finishing the program, and just winning two gold medals in a national shooting competition, they decide you're not qualified to actually join the Navy because, well, Vision. your vision's not good enough, despite the fact that you just scored a bullseye at a thousand yards last week. So at this point, Ching Lee does exactly what every other badass with bad eyesight would do, and he cheats on that fucking eye exam and makes his way into the Navy. Yes! Now, as an officer in training, he gets shuffled around to a bunch of different ships to get a bunch of different experiences, figure out cheated. what he likes doing, figure out what he's good at, get him exposed to everything. That's how this is supposed to go. During that time, he actually publishes his first ever article, and it's about the proper way of shooting a pistol. It gets published in the Naval Magazine, and he actually signs his signature at the bottom with a Chinese symbol again. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I like the quote that he actually put in this magazine. And that was, focus on acquiring accuracy before you try to acquire speed, which is eerily similar to the famous quote from also famous gunslinger, Wyatt Earp, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You got to learn how to be slow yep. in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. Slow down to uh, slow down to speed up. Yep, 100%. My point being, game recognize game. They're both onto something, and you should probably write that shit down. Now, the young Lee finally makes his way onto the USS New Hampshire, and that is when the occupation of Veracruz happens. All right, super brief, oversimplified version of what's happening right now. It is 1914, and Mexico is having a revolution, and the new Mexican government is not a huge fan of the United States of America. Because of that, the Tempico affair ends up happening, which is the Mexican 
government basically captures and detains a bunch of American sailors for a little while. It's a big diplomatic nightmare between Mexico and the United States. Because of that, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, decides that he's going to put an embargo on Mexico and he's not going to let any guns into the country because he's scared that they're going to use them against America. And in April of 1914, Mexico gets a huge shipment of firearms despite the embargo. If so facto, Woodrow Wilson sends in the Navy From and the where? Marines to go get those weapons back. Now bear in mind, this is 1914. There's no Higgins boats. There's no amphibious landing vehicles. Nobody's doing D-Day type shit. So it's literally just a bunch of Navy and Marine dudes getting driven ashore in whaling boats, hopping out and going to find these guns, I guess, because the president said so. So since, you know, America's basically invading Mexico, some of the Mexicans get pretty pissed off, obviously. So they start shooting at the Americans, which, you know, not super happy about it, but I understand the sentiment. I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. Now, unfortunately for them, the downside of shooting at people is they're probably going to shoot back, you know, assuming they have guns, which America always does. Now, somewhere along the line, Lee's entire unit gets pinned down by these enemy snipers that are up on top of roofs and inside of windows and high buildings, basically shooting at guys lower on the ground, and nobody's able to shoot these guys back, and everybody's just pinned down where they're at. Until so, Lee remembering like oh shit i'm the main character with bad eyesight i got this grabs his gun and just walks out in the middle of the street corner in broad fucking daylight with no cover whatsoever and he just sits there with his gun sure enough after a couple of seconds somebody finally shoots at him but they miss and now lee saw where they're at and lee shoots back and remember ching lee doesn't miss and then he continues to sit there and somebody shoots at him and they miss that's Bro forgot he was the main character. He said, wait, I'm not a side character. What am I doing hiding? Bro, I swear on everything. There must be like, you. for those of you who watch anime, you know, sometimes they always overdramatize like things, um, especially when we're talking about like American. We, I've seen it before, uh, especially when it comes to like boxing legends like Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson and stuff like that. But I can imagine them doing this and thinking that it's an overdramatization, dramatization, but it's not. These are things that he actually did. They didn't even have to add anything else. <laughs> Just cue some epic music. That's some, that's some badassery right there. Just sat down and said, all right, show me where you at. Oh, the kahunas. And Lee shoots back and Lee don't miss. And this goes on for a while, pretty much until they quit shooting at Lee, presumably because there was none of them left. When asked about this later in life, the only thing Lee would say was, quote, yeah, I think I got a couple of them. Of all the men that were there and actually saw it, many of them had a much less modest version of this story to tell, with some of them claiming as many as 12 men were dispatched by Lee, all the while he was giving them the first chance to shoot at him. Then, later during this Veracruz side quest, Lee is also credited again with saving a man's life by running through gunfire to get him and provide medical attention. The man is literally Clint Eastwood, except it's 1914 and he's real. Oh, you're gonna look awfully silly with that knife sticking up your ass. Still here? Uh, no. Now, because of the bravery he displayed at Veracruz, he's put up for promotion by his leadership, and he gets denied because his vision is too bad. And at this point, his entire chain of command is basically writing letters of recommendation, essentially yelling at the entire medical bureaucratic side of the Navy that's denying him that they're insane because this guy's awesome. Seriously, he gets like 20 letters of recommendation from high-ranking officers, including the skipper of his current vessel, the USS New Hampshire. And in that letter, he says something along the lines of, I saw Lee crumple a man from 800 yards with iron sights at Veracruz. He can see just fine. So with iron sights. So iron sights meaning, you know, the, the what's put on the actual gun, right? No attachments, no zooms with iron sights. Yeah, come on now. So his promotion gets taken into consideration for an extended period of time. And because of that, he gets taken off sea duty and gets sent basically to the middle of the country. And he is working for the U.S. Navy, going to different factories and figuring out what these factories need to do to be able to better manufacture stuff for the U.S. Navy. During this time, he meets his wife in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Then America enters World War I and he gets sent over to Europe, although he does not get attached to a combat vessel. So he never actually sees combat. After World War I, Lee would go on to compete in the 1920 Olympics, where he would actually win seven medals 
medals, five gold, one silver, one bronze, which would turn out to be the record for the most medals won by any Jeez. one person at any one Olympic Games, and that record would stand until 1980. Okay, just so we're on the same page, dude just won five gold Olympic medals for sharpshooting, and he's having trouble getting promoted Ish. because he has bad eyesight. Anyways, for the rest of the 1920s, Lee spends pretty much the entire time working on different destroyers, just working his way up the ranks, becoming a bigger and better leader. Now, about his style of leadership, everybody absolutely loves this guy that works with him because he has this way where he just teaches people what they need to do, and if they're not good at it, he gets them good at it, and then he just lets them do their job. He doesn't try to micromanage them, he's not up everybody's ass, he just wants to get people where they need to be so they have the skills they need so that they can do their job, and then he goes and dicks off so he can go do target practice and build traps to kill rats because that was like his new hobby. That was seriously what he was known for, building elaborate mouse traps on destroyers. He had ones that were like air guns rigged up to trip wires that would shoot rats, which is the most American shit I've ever heard of in my entire life. There was another one that was really popular where he had a little miniature guillotine that he had electrically rigged up to a push button on his desk and all the boys would sit there and play a game when the rat would run across it, they would try to hit the button just in time to cut the rat in half. And then like whenever there was anything to shoot at from the ship, he had his own private stash of guns in his quarters and he would run out and there'd be these like glass balls from abandoned fishing nets that would be floating in the ocean and he'd run out and shoot at them from the deck and he'd invite the Marines to come out and shoot with him over the PA system. And he's hey man, I'm sitting there thinking about, I'm glad he's on our side because I mean, I'm glad he, you know, turn out and be like a like a like a serial killer or something like that because geez his his activities what he's doing in his off time because he was just craving battle maybe or he just wanted to shoot the, the tra i understand wanting to shoot things but the traps i can't understand that did he what do you call that a master masochist somebody that takes pleasure from the right from from from, from pain takes pleasure from pain but inflicting pain on others is that the right word it's actually out there Ma teaching Masochist. the Marines how to become better shots. Everybody Masochist. absolutely Masochist. loved this guy. So Maybe. that goes on until about 1930, and then he finally makes his way back onto battleships and heavy cruisers, at which point he gets absolutely obsessed with gunnery. He wants to shoot the big guns better than anybody ever has. He actually ends up writing a paper that later on got published talking about how battleships need to take into consideration the curvature of the Earth when they're gathering targeting data, and he develops the calculations for the battleships to do that. He's literally teaching people how to treat a battleship the way a sniper treats a gun and it's Sorry. highly effective wrong, because after publishing word. that paper another battleship commander actually took that data and started implementing it and his battleship won most accurate ship for the next three years in a row and he said it was all due to lee's calculations okay if you're not catching on lee is actually treating his naval career the same way he treated his academic career he's not interested in the normal coursework of like leading and micromanaging a bunch of sailors he wants to get everybody where they need to be he wants to get through his work as fast as he can so that he so can, can go, go do stuff that interests him, like pioneering new ways to be accurate with gunnery. Because of this, he develops a reputation as a problem solver. So, late 1930s, they send him over to Washington, D.C., and his orders are basically, get everybody ready for war because we know it's coming. Okay, now this is probably the least coolest but most important part of the entire story. This man essentially gets sent to Washington, D.C. to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the United States Navy's biggest nemesis, the Bureau of Ordnance. You, help you Michael. bitch, God! Michael. You're very helpful, aren't you? You try to help everybody. To. Do you want to play another game? Okay, if you Let don't know, the Bureau of Ordnance is a bureaucratic nightmare that does nothing but slow down and halt any progress the U.S. Navy tries to make at literally anything ever. For example, if you remember like a month ago when I made the USS Parchy video with loss and red ramage and he was shooting torpedoes at all these Japanese ships, but the torpedoes would hit and then not blow up because they were duds because it's a known fact that the Mark 14 torpedo fucking sucked and he complained to the chain of command and the chain of command told him, too bad you just suck with torpedoes the torpedoes are fine that was the bureau of ordnance so basically the chain of command has sent lee to washington okay. dc to go toe to toe with these guys because they know that lee doesn't have the time or the temperament to put up with their bureaucratic bullshit and they're absolutely correct because willis lee is about to turn into a wood chipper for red tape so lee shows up and he starts learning and finding out about all these fancy new toys the navy has that are just being held up by bureaucratic nonsense for example i don't know fucking radars. Lee, being the forward thinker that he is, he's like, you can put a screen in my office that tells me where the enemy is so that I can shoot them with my big ass guns without even having to see them. Yeah, put that on every fucking ship in the Navy. What's wrong with you? But don't worry because the Bureau of Ordnance and their infinite fucking wisdom doesn't seem to agree with Lee and they don't think they're going to be that big of a deal and they just want to put them on some ships and they don't want to waste all their money on radars because they're dumb, apparently. But they Somebody help me understand that. 
it seems like it's all positive money. They must have thought that they had effort. I don't want to assume that they're just idiots or like stupid because, you know, these people are way smarter than me. So I, I, I like to assume positive intent. They must have had some type of good reason. Please tell me they had a good reason for not doing that. They know Lee's not going to take no for an answer, so they tell Lee that they can't get any more radars due to manufacturing shortages, to which Lee immediately goes, fine, then I'll buy them from Britain. Magically, the Bureau of Ordnance found all the radars he could possibly need. Imagine that. Okay, next order of business, American submarines. Their biggest weakness is having purified water because they can't purify water fast enough for how quickly they consume it because the crew needs water and the batteries in the submarines at this point in time also eat a ton of water. Luckily, there's a new EVAP system that's gonna allow them to have way more purified water and it's gonna be great. Unfortunately, it's held up in bureaucratic red tape. Okay, like they're there, they're done, they've been manufactured, they're ready but the government wants to run more tests on them even though everybody in the navy is like no they fucking work we just they're just not letting us use them so lee just walks in issues the order to install them and if anybody has a problem they can blame him so lee's just getting shit done he's checking things off now at this point in time whenever you're doing a bunch of paperwork for the navy there's like a status box where you hit it with a rubber stamp to tell everybody how important this paper needs to get through the bureaucratic process now there's three statuses there's routine priority and urgent. Obviously in that order, urgent is like, we need to get this done as quickly as possible. Now, everything Lee marked was urgent. urgent. He didn't give a shit. He needed his shit done right now because that's just the type of guy he is. But unfortunately they were still just not getting it done fast enough to his liking. So he's like, fuck it. I'm going to get my own rubber stamp made that said frantic. So then whenever anybody got Lee's documentation for the first time in their entire naval career, there's a new word stamped there in red ink that sounds more important than urgent. So everybody's just like, oh shit, we're doing this first. And then Lee just and uses this to keep on powering through to get more and more shit done. Next thing is to get a schoolhouse stood up for the U.S. Navy that teaches sailors how to read aerial reconnaissance Problem pictures solver. because that's going to be huge in an upcoming war because they're going to need pictures to show where all the reefs and all the atolls are and they're going to have to be able to read those pictures accurately to get proper intel. So at first, the chain of command is like, okay, well, we'll get Hollywood involved. They know things about like cameras and shit. That's the right answer, right? And Lee and a couple of other officers that actually have good ideas are like, uh, no, why don't we just go over to Britain and ask them to help us? We'll send a couple of guys over, get them trained by them because they already do this really well and we're on the same team. It would be great. Why wouldn't you do that? We can share information with them and vice versa and we all get better together. Hooray. At which point the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory is like, no, absolutely not because the United States Navy is way better than the British Navy and we know that because we conducted a study that we verified ourselves. Yeah. Okay, now in hindsight, I think we can all agree that's dumb, and that is why Lee ended up sending a guy over there anyways for any bullshit-ass excuse that he could find, and then ended up extending his orders every time they ran short, so he was just over there soaking up as much information and training as humanly possible, and that guy would actually come back and found the Naval School for being able to read aerial photography. Okay, so that's going on. Lee just keeps charging, tackling more issues. Next thing on the docket, the Mark 53, aka the Proximity Fuse. Okay, I cannot stress to you how important this one actually is. This is one of the most important developments in World War II is the proximity fuse. Okay, it is basically the new type of anti-aircraft ammunition. Your only options prior to this were like shooting basically birdshot up at planes and hoping you fucking hit them, shooting 50 cals up at planes hoping you hit them, literally trying to hit a plane with a bullet, or you had mechanically timed ammunition where you were shooting it and it had a timer and then it would blow up in midair and you're just hoping that a plane happens to mm. cross at that exact moment and everything works out. You're basically playing the lottery with all of those until the Mark 50 Battleship proximity fuse came out. Okay, it's a little more complicated than this, but it basically has its own tiny little miniature Doppler radar inside of it. And when it's flying through the air, that Doppler radar is emitting signals and it's reading anything bouncing back at it. And once something gets close to this ammunition, it starts sending the signals back. And when it gets close enough and those signals come back frequently enough, it knows that it's near a plane wow. in midair and it just blows up on its own when it gets near enough to the plane. Okay, it's the first type of ammunition that actually knows where the plane is and blows up at the right fucking time. It's a big deal. So naturally, the Bureau of Ordnance is like, wow, this thing's incredible. This is a total game changer. We're going to go ahead and get in the way for no fucking reason. You want to know what they say? I'm going to tell you. They say that you're not going to be allowed to use that new ammunition until it has a 100% 
reliability rating. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say that again, but slower. The Bureau of Ordnance said that you're not allowed to use this new ammunition until it is a hundred percent reliable. Can you understand how fucking stupid that is? You know what's a hundred percent reliable? No, nothing. nothing. Nothing is a hundred percent reliable. Fucking condoms don't even have a hundred percent reliability, right? You want to get technical? Fucking abstinence isn't even a hundred percent reliable because Jesus was a thing, okay? I'm pregnant. Even homing missiles. Underwater, the torpedoes was even 100%. This little rant that he went on about Jesus? <laughs> Abstinence isn't even 100% reliable because Jesus was a thing, okay? I'm pregnant. From my finger? No, you don't understand. God <laughs> has blessed me with his child. You banged Kevin God from South Nazareth? You wanna know how smart and forward-thinking Ching Lee is? It's like 1939, and he already knew that the future of naval warfare was gonna be all about the carriers, and he's 100% right, but he knew at this point in time, okay? Because they came and they wanted to build this class of American heavy cruisers. It was gonna be the Alaska class. They made two of them, but they wanted to make like fucking 10 of them. And Lee came in and was like, no, those are dumb. You shouldn't have made the first two. Take all those resources, all that money, all that everything. Build more fucking aircraft carriers. He was very adamant about it from the very start. And he ended up being right. And that's exactly what the Navy did. And it had a humongous impact on World War II. Okay, so bearing in mind that he knows that the future of naval power is gonna be all based off of carriers and planes, he goes and adopts a strategy that every American ship, it, we're, we're done. We're done with these like pretty observation decks and shit. If there's room on the deck, we're putting anti-aircraft guns. Every American ship is gonna look like a fucking porcupine covered with 40 millimeter bofers and 20 millimeter orlicons. Okay, the only problem, he needs all of the guns. This dude sits down and does the math and figures out how many 20 millimeter orlicon, how many 40 millimeter bofers he needs to put on the decks of every ship in the U.S. Navy and puts in a purchase order for it and it gets kicked back because they're like, well, we're not going to put all these on the decks of the ships because, you know, we just don't think that we need that much. And Lee is like, cool, didn't ask for permission to put them on the decks. I just asked to oh. order the guns. To which they're like, shit, he has the authority to do that. And they stamped his thing approved and send it back to him and he gets to order the guns. Then he whips out the old eraser because he filled out the last half of the work order in pen and after it says, order guns, full stop stop he erases the full stop and then writes down and install them on every ship in the navy full stop and then that's what he does and then <laughs> it's got right here man oh that's oh that's great oh that's that's a problem solver I mean, honestly, man, if I was overseer, I wouldn't even be mad, man. If he keep doing this, he keep getting me. I, I don't even know. I, mean, I might get chewed out as his overseer, but I wouldn't even be mad. I I'll stop and then writes down and install them on every ship in the Navy. Full stop. And then that's what he does. And then every time a ship comes back into port, it's just like an army of naval dudes come on and just put anti-aircraft guns on everything everywhere. Then December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens. At this point, everything changes. Admiral Ernest oh. King, like top dog at the Navy at this point, looks over to Lee. He's like, this guy gets shit done. I need somebody to make sure that the rest of the Navy is taking this seriously. So he promotes Lee to the Admiral of Fleet Readiness. And it is now Lee's job to make sure that the entire U.S. Navy Admiral. is like like ready for war and treating this how they need to be treating this. And Ching Lee's immediate concern is security because they're they're way too lax, okay? They're not even checking IDs, they're just letting people through, whatever. I mean, the orders have changed, like they've been told, hey, button this shit up, there's gonna be spies coming, like whatever, but doesn't mean they're actually gonna do it. So Lee's gonna get to the bottom of that. First things first, remember, prankster at heart, he goes, gets a new military ID made, except this one has a picture of Hitler on it. He then proceeds to go and see how many maximum security naval institutions that he can get into can with a US them. Navy ID with a picture of fucking Hitler on it in World War II. And guess how many he gets into? All of them. Nobody stops him. Like, it's so ridiculous. Wow. He's like, I don't, I don't think I look like Hitler, do I? I mean, I guess we're both dudes. Uh, fuck it. We're just gonna have to get more ridiculous. So he gets another ID made with the famous female actress Mae West on it. And he's like, well, I definitely don't look like her. Let's see how much shit I can get just into to make now. Sure and then he still fluke. gets into a bunch of places that he's not supposed to with this Mae West ID. So basically he's chewing ass and getting everybody ready for the security level required for World War II with espionage and spies and all kinds of shit. Like he's doing full on Ocean's Eleven type shit. That's actually, wow. Wow. That, the, that is an amazing thing that he did right before that. God, it was so lax, man.
He's got subordinates That's... dressing up as butlers, going into fancy hotels, stealing top secret documents from top government officials, holding them until they get reported as stolen just to see how long it takes. All kinds of crazy shit. So this goes great. And as a reward, Admiral King makes Lee the new commander of all of America's fast battleships. So now Lee's back in the game. He goes and immediately starts training the entire crew of the USS Washington in gunnery and night combat because he knows that the Japanese Navy has a big edge at night combat, or at least they did before radar. He goes and then masters the radar to the degree that he's probably- well, what, was Jap what was the Japanese edge over night combat since they got the radar? Yeah, let me know that. Was it just their machinery? The most knowledgeable person hmm. on these radars in the US Navy, except for the people that literally built them. Sorry, I ran out of time and I had to catch a flight. So we're finishing this video from Texas in my friend Eli's studio. Anyways, back to the story. Not only is he training all of his guys in nighttime combat, he also has to basically go I back like through setup. and retrain his entire gunnery department because he's not treating the USS Washington the same way every other battleship treats its guns. He's going through and treating each of the nine guns on the USS Washington like it's its own individual sniper rifle. And while he's doing that, getting the guns more and more accurate, he comes to the realization that all the targeting data and the charts that came with the USS Washington Washington from the manufacturer were wrong. They were off. They weren't accurate enough. So he goes to the Bureau of Ordnance again and is like, hey, your charts are wrong. To which the Bureau of Ordnance is like, no, they're not. You're wrong. Except for the fact, obviously, Ching Lee doesn't miss. So he says, fuck it. And he redoes all of the charts and all of the targeting data himself. You see, you see the reoccurring pattern that's going on with uh, Willis, right? He first asks and then process the information he's like all right fine i'm gonna go get it done first but it always looks like he informs you what he would like to get done before he decides to do it himself i imagine people in the military understood this pattern of behavior and you know that if you don't feel in or at least feel the request that he's asking he's going to find another way but i guess as long as he does everything within his power that's not doing too much then it's okay. But you know, how long he's been doing this or, or <clears throat> it's like one of the things where every time he goes and he does things differently, his way, the results are so potent that you've just got to shut up and agree. Hmm? Over the course of the next couple months, he gets his crew and the guns on the USS Washington so accurate that he ends up having a light cruiser from his task force go 10 miles away. And then he fires the guns towards that ship and has the ship call in and say how close it was to the actual target. And he can walk these shells right up to the wake of this light cruiser without actually touching it. Literally like putting an apple on top of your head and letting your buddy shoot at it with a bow and arrow, except he's doing it with battleships. So fast forward November 1942, the battle for Guadalcanal is going on and the Japanese Navy is being sent to go bombard Henderson Field, which is an American airstrip that is instrumental to the war effort and they can't let it get destroyed. So Lee and his task force get sent in to go defend it. And right out of the gate, this entire thing is a shit show. They're sending in Lee in the USS Washington and the USS South Dakota, the USS Washington sister ship. Now the real problem, they're sending in four destroyers with them, but these destroyers were picked for the sole purpose of they were there and they were the ones with the most fuel. They had never worked with Lee. They didn't know how he operated. They did not really know what was going on, but it just kind of happened. They all got lumped together and got sent out to go defend Henderson Field. So they're out there on patrol. They end up getting basically ambushed by a Japanese task force that opens fire on the destroyers this task force has managed to hug one of these smaller islands to avoid being detected by radar open fire on the four destroyers mm. ended up sinking three of them and critically damaging the third at which point they start opening fire on the uss south dakota at which point ching lee sends a famous radio transmission stand aside i'm coming through this is Ching Lee. Now this Japanese task force has a couple of destroyers. It also has the IJN Otago and the Takao, both of which are heavy cruisers. And they have their flagship, the IJN Kirishima, which was originally a battle cruiser, but in the 1930s, it got a bunch of upgrades in armor and firepower, having it reclassed as a battleship. This is now a battleship versus battleship fight. The Japanese task force is continuing to target the South Dakota. Lee sneaks around the backside, clears the South Dakota, turns all nine of his guns and opens fire directly at their flagship, the Kirishima. And with the first salvo, he hits. And then he wow. keeps hitting. And he hits more. And he's hitting the enemy so hard, so fast, so accurately, they don't even start returning fire. And within the span of five minutes, 
he manages to hit the Kirishima with 20 main battery hits and 24 hits from his secondary five inch guns. Okay, each one of those shells is 16 inches in diameter and weighs 1,700 pounds. Willis Ching Lee just bitch slapped the Kirishima with a goddamn car dealership in five minutes. Okay, just so we're on the same page, the Kirishima has now been reclassified twice. The Japanese upgraded it and reclassified it from a battle cruiser to a battleship, and Ching Lee has now just downgraded it from a battleship to a, a battle. fucking coral reef, and he did it in five minutes. This is the last time in world history that a battleship sank another battleship in combat. Now, at this point, the wow. USS South Dakota's had so many electrical problems that the guns are down and the radio's down. Lee has no way to communicate with the South Dakota, but he can tell that it's trying to pull away from the fight and it's still getting attacked by the two Japanese heavy cruisers and the destroyers. So, so, so I understand that that's, that's a lot of firepower in such a short amount of time, but what is kind of like your average hit or miss, right? Between two battleships, especially considering this is the first time one was sunk. Lee, not like how many fire, how many shots, right? I just want to understand the magnitude. I mean, obviously 100% all shots, but I just want to understand the magnitude, the, 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 the greatness of what he's done. Right, so I can have something to compare it to. Yeah, let me know. Knowing the status of the USS South Dakota decides that he is the most able man in this fight and he needs to get all of their attention so that they can come fight him instead. So he opens fire on the heavy cruisers, trying to get their attention, which he gets. He then proceeds to go the opposite direction as the USS South Dakota so that they quit chasing it down and they chase him instead. So they're chasing him down, but here's the problem. They're chasing him, they're behind him. He can't turn the ship around to shoot at him with the big guns without getting shot in return. And he doesn't want to get his boat shot up because this isn't a boat it's a goddamn precision instrument okay this is a giant fucking sniper rifle i don't want to be taking shots so he comes up with a better plan you see he hasn't just been working on the gunnery skills of the nine 16 inch guns on the uss washington he's also been doing it on all of the five inch guns as well and those turrets can still turn around and hit the enemy and they are so accurate with their fire that lee orders them to start targeting the searchlights on the other ships and they start blowing all the lights out so they're not going to be able to see the uss washington the at night and man. then oh. they start firing star clusters which is just white phosphorus the reason they do that is because remember the japanese don't have radar that's not how they're targeting the washington all they're targeting has to be done optically so now the japanese guys are looking at night and there's white phosphorus burning as it's floating through the sky oh. and it's going to fuck up all of their optics and they're not going to be able to hit the USS Washington. So Ching Lee and the USS Washington do this and just lead the Japanese further and further away from the USS South Dakota until he's confident that they're going to get away too. And then he just slips away into the night, virtually unscathed. He got hit a single time by a five inch gun, which is the equivalent to a grown ass man getting hit with an airsoft gun. It's nothing. <laughs> For this, Admiral Lee would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by Admiral Halsey. And when he received it, his crew demanded a speech. He turned around and simply said, and I quote, you want it, I'll wear it, which is one of the coolest things I've ever heard a military leader say. That's pretty cool. Ever. For the rest of World War humble. II, it was honestly pretty quiet for the USS Washington. They were involved in some shore bombardments and they mostly just ran anti-aircraft operations for the aircraft carriers because it was a carrier-based war. Then by 1945, all of the Japanese battleships had been recommissioned into coral reefs and there just wasn't any reason to have all the fast battleships around anymore. So they took Lee from the battleship and they wanted to use his talents elsewhere because now the biggest threat to the US Navy was Kamikaze and they wanted Ching Lee yeah. to be working on the anti-aircraft measures to help prevent this. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending because as he made his way back to America to begin working on those anti-aircraft measures, on August 25th, 1945, he would suffer a massive heart attack Dang. that would kill him in a matter of minutes. So in conclusion, that wow. is the story of Willis yes. Ching Lee. He is one of the most important people in naval warfare history, and he gets nowhere near the credit that he deserves. And I would argue that he is absolutely the greatest gunslinger of all time. The definition of a gunslinger is somebody that carries a gun and knows how to use it and i don't think there's ever been anybody on the planet better at that than willis ching lee not only does this man carry a gun and know how to use it he has a gun that carries him and he knows how to use that one too capable of hitting a bullseye with any caliber of gun from a pistol to the 16 inch guns on a battleship this man could do it so thank you for watching best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com quack bang out I know he's got an outro. Let's see what it is, if there is one. Shit. Eli doesn't have the same setup as me. I can't dramatically turn the lights off as I walk out. Wait, wait, wait. The he said he's got the editor. Out. Thank God, editors. Yes, yes. Also, there's one thing I wanted to notate. His editor right here, this 
this sword that he has in the background, that looks like a witcher's sword. It's completely unrelated, but his his friend might be an anime anime uh cyberpunk type of love loving this episode set up. Anyways, humble, we need movies about this. That's what we need. Cause this is I need to see this in action if there hasn't already been one. But anyways, that's the end of this video. Dave's out.